All right, it's working. Excellent. Okay, are we live? Are we working here? Let's see here. I need to take some drastic measures to try and get this thing working. Yeah. Can you see and hear me? Let me know. Okay. Uh, can you see and hear me? Specific questions. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Let's, uh, let's get this set up. Um, man, I tried to field test most of this stuff before I left, but you know how it works with things like this. There's always variables that you don't consider, and, uh, yeah. Anyway, here we are. Um, there we go. Make sure I got chat open. Excellent. And... There we go. Well, let me get this put on properly. There we are. See, I might have to take this back outside again and see if I can get it to work. I mean, the problem that I was trying to... Oh! Excellent. Okay, it's working again. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> perfect. Okay, I guess it just needed to be restarted. Well, welcome, everybody. Back to paleontologizing. And again, we're here at Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park. And the nearest town to here would be what? Gabs, Nevada? Gabs, Nevada yeah. yeah. This is Jeff Morris here, who is the uh, park supervisor, right? Correct. He's very graciously agreed to take us on a little tour today. So cross your fingers that, uh, that everything works properly. We've got the Starlink router and my battery pack right there. Hopefully the signal reaches throughout the whole building. It's like, I don't know, hopefully it just kind of bounces around in here. And right. Yeah, yeah. But... Uh, Anyway, good stuff. Everybody's saying hello to you too. So, uh, well, and, and thanking you for uh, for letting us pay a visit. So, anyway, uh, a lot of people, when they think of the state of Nevada, they probably think of Las Vegas. They think of casinos. They might even think of Reno. Since I was a little kid, every time I think of Nevada, I think of Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park because that is one of the biggest fossil sites in the entire state, and probably, at least for you know the Mesozoic era, probably the most important scientifically. Um, for vertebrate fossils. So uh, here's a, a wonderful taste of that, that excellent Nevada fossil heritage here. Um, let's take a look, yeah. All right, come on. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're going to start here at the display case and go over uh, kind of the geologic history of the area, if uh -huh. you will. Um, just to give you an idea, when these creatures were alive, this was the late Triassic period, roughly mm -hmm. 220 million years ago. And this map is a little outdated. There but if we you go, notice, yeah. this is when Pangea was still one supercontinent. Mm -hmm. This little red dot represents where Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park used to be back in ancient right. time. When the ichthyosaurs were alive, it would have been roughly 220 to 180 million years ago, late Triassic. And they would have been swimming up and down the coastline of Pangea as it was starting to break apart. Mm -hmm. Eventually, with plate tectonics, continental shift and drift, the North American plate broke off. And we became landlocked over time, and the Shoshone Range, as well as many of the other mountain ranges in Nevada, slowly started to build roughly 30 to 60 million years ago. And that's what uplifted these creatures to an elevation of almost 7,000 feet in the desert. Mm -hmm. That's how you get a marine reptile out here in Nevada. Pretty awesome, yeah. Um, and so let's take a look at that vertebra, actually, sure. right there. Yeah. So this was one of the original discoveries. It was first discovered in 1928. Um, Sy Muller was here from Stanford University. Uh -huh. We think he was hired by some of the local mining companies to study the Mesozoic outcroppings looking for gold and silver deposits. Huh. He stumbled across these vertebrae, not this one in particular, uh -huh. but uh, he wasn't much of a paleontologist. So when he went back to Fallon, Nevada, he contacted Margaret Wheat. She was a fossil enthusiast, a naturalist, hmm. and a colleague of Dr. Charles Camp at UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So Berkeley had the lead paleontology department on the West Coast at the time. Dr. Right. Camp was an ichthyosaur expert. Uh -huh. Yep. But these vertebrae sat on his desk for about 25 years. 
<laughs> you had wow. a lot going on. The Great Depression, uh, World War II was starting. Definitely, yeah. So it wasn't until 1954 when Camp began his excavations here with his students and colleagues, and they unearthed 37 of these animals. Holy cow. See out in the quarry here. Mm -hmm. Uh, basically from 1954 to 1961. Uh -huh. That's really where we get our notoriety. We have the largest concentration of ichthyosaurs found anywhere in North America, right here in Nevada. Very, very cool. Yes. Yeah. I actually heard from a colleague of mine. He called me up last night. Uh, I told him that I was going to be here. And he's like, oh, yeah, Randy Ermis and some other people have been doing some excavations near here, some yes. of our colleagues. Yes. Uh, the Smithsonian was here with Neil Kelly. Okay, uh, yeah. Paul Noble. Uh -huh. um, they were just here, actually, a couple weeks ago. Shoot, I just missed them. Checking yeah. things out. But they spent <laughs> a good portion of 2021 up here. Actually, nice. 2022 was last year. Uh -huh. And they were studying some of Dr. Camp's other quarries. Uh -huh. And they did find new remains of Ichthyosaur, um, Shonosaurus, possibly up in the canyon, up on Forest Service property. Very, very cool. Yep. Wow. So that's really neat. There's ongoing research here. This is not just like a historical site. This is something that there's work going on into the future here. It's been fairly recent as far as the recent excavations. Yeah. The last excavation done in the park really before last year was 1984. Uh -huh. And that was on this site just to unearth a, a skull that we'll see on the backside. Oh, cool. Uh, by Dr. Sam Wells, who is a colleague of Dr. Camps and also yeah. on the original dig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sam Wells is also the, uh, he described Dilophosaurus. We've talked about him a lot on my channel in the past. Um, but yeah, yeah, very cool. I did a lot of work at UC Berkeley back when I was in high school and later. So, um, yeah, Wells is a big name there for sure. Oh, yeah. 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 So one other thing we have is probably one of the largest genus and species of ichthyosaur here. Yeah. Um, let's put it on my other page here. These are your Triassic species. And this represents, there's actually two, uh, genuses on there that are Nevada representatives. Symbospondylus being, yeah. Uh, one of the larger ones, around 30 feet in length, and that mm -hmm. was found up near Lovelock, Nevada, back in 1905. Right. The significance of that is that's the cast of the skull that you see in the display case. Yeah, and we have the original, I think. It's in the Carson City Museum. Uh, oh, it is? Okay. That's correct. Well, I think we've got another cast at Berkeley, then, because I recognize this specimen. I've helped move it several times from our oversized. Uh, when we walk yeah. around today, you'll notice the skulls didn't fossilize with any detail. So that's uh -huh. what it, that would look like. That's just the fiberglass cast. Right. So these would be your Triassic species of ichthyosaur. Uh-huh. Or genus, and these are the um, Jurassic genus of Victiosaur. Uh -huh. And you can see over time how they evolved to be a little more dolphin and porpoise like. So, right. not only do we have the largest concentration in Nevada, we have some of the largest species of genus ever discovered as mm -hmm. well. So, that's really where we get our notoriety. Very, very cool. Yeah. And uh, I like these little models that you've got out here too the, uh, yeah, the Safari Limited one. Yep. <laughs> that's very cool. It helps. With the ammonite in its mouth. Keeps, yeah. the, keeps the kids uh, interested. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Don't let me forget, I actually 3D printed a, an ichthyosaur model to like give us a gift. See here? Let me grab it out of the car before I go sure. today. So don't I let me forget. Neil Kelly made a vertebrae, 3D vertebrae. Oh, very, very cool. Yeah. Nice. They're so <laughs> fish like. It's amazing that like these animals are, you know, they, they are descended from terrestrial reptiles, but exactly. their vertebrae are so fish like. Yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. So not just in terms of their overall appearance, but. In terms of the vertebral morphology, that's pretty nuts. Yep. Yeah. And that's where the most common part of the body we're going to find today are the vertebrae. Basically, yeah. as, as far back as this dates, you didn't have very good preservation. Uh -huh. um, so the largest bones of the ichthyosaurs fossilized, as well as things like your ammonites, like the one in the display case, mm -hmm. and other shellfish. Right. So. Very, very cool. Let me yeah. just shut the door real quick. Sure thing, yeah. This building itself really reminds me of a cathedral or something like that. It's, it's got an almost kind of like religiously reverent quality to it. I love it. Uh, yeah. If you want to join me down here, I'll point out yeah. some, some of the ichthyosaurus for us. So basically, I don't know if the, your, your <clears throat> folks at home can see the landscape outside the window. Yeah. That's exactly what's sat on top of here. So once mm -hmm. The ichthyosaur was exposed naturally by erosion. They started to dig in these uh, piles of limestone. Uh -huh. And they found, like I said, 37 animals originally wow. in six quarries total. Because uh -huh. there was so much material in this one particular quarry, Camp had the idea to leave it in situ. Mm -hmm. And that's what we find today. So you're going to see the real bones as they still exist in the ground. Uh -huh. So if we remember that skull that we just saw in the display case, that's where you see it literally. Can you guys see my green dot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the top of the skull. So if I grab my model, uh -huh. You'll see that's the area right above the eye sockets here on the model. Right. And then these two bones that form the letter V or L mm -hmm. are what's left of the jaw bones. They actually broke right here at the oh, end the of lower the jaw. Jaws. Okay. And they should extend down to form a snout, but uh -huh. they got reflex backwards probably when the mountain was shifting and moving and uh -huh. basically contorted. 
Very cool. Yeah. Now if we jump up here to the letter B, these are uh -huh. called coracoids, just like the small bones of the human shoulder. Those mm -hmm. are actually have the largest bones of the chest cavity right. of the ichthyosaur. Uh -huh. And it separates the flippers. If you notice, there's two letter C's, one to the left and one to the right. Uh -huh. Those are what's left of the two or three largest bones of each front flipper. So we're not seeing Very all cool. those small bones called the phalanges. Uh -huh. So we're basically seeing the animal like upside down. Those are the lower jaws right there. Correct. Upside down, just like this. And then you've got the two, two flippers. pectoral flippers like that. Very cool. And then right above this flipper bone at sea, you can see there's a section of the ribcage. Yeah, those long ribs, yeah. And the majority of that ribcage lies across from the letter D. Wow. And that you can see there's a separation here uh -huh. by this earthquake fault. That's Holy cow, there. there's a fault running right through the middle of the quarry. There is. There's a, it's called a left lateral translation. Wow. Welcome to Nevada. <laughs> that's and that's amazing. Finally, here yeah. D, you find the vertebrae like we just showed you. Uh -huh. And you follow that trail of backbone right to crust. Yeah, e, look at that. Continuing to E all the way up to letter F, which starts the tailbone. Vertebrae. Holy cow, that's a big animal. And unfortunately, they lost about a third of the tail length due to erosion. Uh -huh. uh, but if you were to straighten this creature out, that's what's depicted on our big wall outside. Right. 50 feet in length. It's like practically the size of a Greyhound bus or something. That's... Uh, that's pretty amazing. Exactly. Yeah. What's the, the taphonomic, I'm sorry I'm like jumping around a little bit in terms of your tour, but the taphonomic setting for this, like is this um, like shallow marine, is it deep they marine? It was anywhere from three to 600 feet underneath the surface of the ocean. Holy it's, cow, wow. It is the looning limestone formation. Yeah. So if you're interested at home, you could do some research on that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, but they think it was adjacent to a continental shelf, something with deep water, because these were predatory okay. animals and they fed on the giant squid. Right. So they think that it was definitely access to deep water, and it was actually mm -hmm. down near the equator hmm. when uh, Pangea was still one continent. Uh huh. Very, very cool. Wow. And so you would call this, this is limestone here, right? Correct, floating limestone. Yeah. Very, very cool. Now I'm noticing that it's hard to miss the big model that's hanging up there. We and if you, you, you can go check the doors, but that's okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. We actually found that online. Oh, really? A gentleman made that for amusement <laughs> parks and museums. Uh -huh. Yeah, and he gave us a really good deal and it fit through the front door, so we thought it looked cool. For Excellent. It's very, like, purposes. kind of s scaly, scraggly look like. These would have been very streamlined animals, a lot like a whale or something like that to reduce drag. Right, it wasn't yeah. armored like that at all. Yeah. <laughs> he actually recovered skin pigment from some over in another site in Europe that oh. uh, was very anaerobic, so it led to good uh, Yeah, yeah. Was that, was that Solnhofen in Germany, maybe? Uh, it was Holzmann. Holzmann, yeah, there you go. Yep. Sorry, Solnhofen is Jurassic. Old on this Triassic. And they actually found, think, recovered, yeah. they think they found skin pigment. And these were actually more of the dolphin gray color. Gotcha. Some were actually a brown color. So. Yeah. Very, very cool. Yep. Yeah. Actually, no, Holtzmann's probably Jurassic, too. That's where I think some of the original Ichthyosaurus specimens come from, from Germany. Anyway. Um, very cool. Yeah. Let's, can we continue on and, awesome. yeah. and keep looking? Yeah. I'll follow you. So, as I mentioned, there's nine different animals in this quarry. We just saw number one. Uh -huh. Specimen two lies right here at the letter G. Right, look at those hurts. We yeah. don't have one complete animal, but you notice know, there's another backbone column here. Uh -huh. uh, there's 14 individual vertebrae. Uh -huh. We have one red bone to the right down here. Uh -huh. And they were excavating trying to find more of this animal down in these lower areas. They never did find it just due to erosion. Sure. If yeah. you come across our first animal, however, you'll notice up here there's probably four or five vertebrae uh -huh. in the line, which suggests that creature was actually laying on top of the first one. Gotcha. So there's kind of a big pile of them here. Uh -huh. uh, whatever caused their extinction, it was simultaneous because they're all found the same way of sediment. But there's right. evidence of them sinking through the water column and forming a pile, if you will. Gotcha. Wow. So we think that this is not like a, a you know, over a long period of time attrition site. This is like these animals live pretty close to each other in terms of time. It's not like they came right. here. You know, a decade later, another one fell down or anything like that. They think like there that. was simultaneous a, a death. Though. Right. The most widely accepted theory is that of a red tide, food poisoning. Right, they yeah. They think this, this area is rich with ammonite life, and this mm -hmm. pod or family of ichthyosaur swam through here and consumed the ammonites, which had been affected by that red tide. So that toxic right. algae blooms produced by the phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually supported by Jennifer Hogler, who did her PhD studies here right. in the 90s. Uh-huh. Uh, she was measuring slight toxicity levels in the fossilized ammonites, clams, and oysters and things. And that's what she attributed that to. Interesting. That would make a lot of sense. I mean, yeah. Now, with Neil Kelly and those folks, uh, Randy Armas, they were here. They actually think they discovered some um, embryonic material. Uh -huh. They think this could have possibly been a birthing ground, too. Very, very cool. Which they wow. never discovered on the original Dingo Doctor camp. Uh -huh. So that's kind of uh, their focus now, I believe. 
Right. Yeah. Really interesting stuff. And I'm sure you'll mention this later in the talk, but I should just mention here. These animals gave birth to live young. So when we say birthing ground, it's not like they're going to lay their eggs on the beach like a sea turtle or something. These are animals that, you know, gave birth to one young at a time, really well developed, and just gave live birth to it. So They revived viperous reptiles, which is pretty rare. Yeah, really, really neat. Yeah. All right, specimen three. So this looks just like the one hanging above us, like uh -huh. the water. So that's why our model is kind of situated where it is. Gotcha. If we were to lower that down onto its belly, that's what we're going to find here. Okay. This is the separation between the backbone and the tailbone. So this is ah. the rear pelvic section. Okay. And these two bones these are, are caudal vertebrae. Okay. These are the femurs of the rear flipper. That's crazy that those femurs are so small, too. In most animals, the femur is like the largest bone in the body by far. Right. For ichthyosaurs, it's, it's, it's just rudimentary. Another, yeah. Just another flipper bone. Yeah. Um, the tailbone actually go underneath the walkway. They had to build uh, on top of it to get the building on top of the mountainside here. Gotcha. But above all, you find the backbone of the uh -huh. And they're kind of scattered about. But now you can see the enormity of the ribcage. It extends all the way up the hill here. Holy cow. Very cool. Continuing all the way up. And it's kind of hard to see the letter H here. I think uh -huh. the mouse might it. But those, again, are the coracoids of the chest bones. Uh -huh. A few small neck vertebrae. But unfortunately, being near the apex of the quarry, they had in the front flipper assembly uh -huh. rode it down in the canyon before they got it. Gotcha. Yeah. That's like I was talking about last night on stream. Erosion is both the best friend and the worst enemy of the paleontologist. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, very, very cool. I love seeing the ribs like that, too. That's, yeah. uh, that's really, really neat. It's just, wow, there's the torso of the animal. Really, really cool. We have the exact opposite on specimen four. So if you want to follow me up here? Yeah. Let's hope that our. Uh, yeah, I think our signal is holding. Good. Excellent. So this is probably the most well-preserved skull. You can find my dog here. Yeah, here. look at that. This is the tip of the upper snout. So if you yeah, and, the one we saw in the display case, you uh -huh. trace that through. And M right there, that's the symphysis between the two lower jaws that's where the they meet, right? The lower jaw. Yeah. Here you can see the curvature of the top of the skull. Uh -huh. So imagine that big eye being right there. The Holy eyes cow. Of these animals are close to 12 inches in diameter. Uh -huh. You can see the base of the lower jaw here. Very, very so cool. It's just kind of laying on the side looking right at us. Yeah. Up here we find the uh, right front flipper assembly, so the radius, the element, the scapula. Uh -huh. Probably just the radius to the right hand side. And this was most likely the original discovery with these backbone vertebrae right at the top of the floor. Gotcha. So okay. those were what were naturally exposed originally uh -huh. and led to the excavation of this quarry. Really, really cool. Wow. Man, that skull is, I want to give everybody a sense of scale here. It's really astonishing. Ten foot long skull. That's, yeah. About three meters for all of our non-American viewers. Um, yeah, excellent. And really, really cool. Specimen five is right here. Uh huh. This one's folded in half. They're most likely due to some geologic event. It probably right. decomposed and then got folded over in half. Uh huh. And if you notice up here, you can see a lot of fragmented rib bone. Sure. The majority of that rib cage lies below the letter O down here. Uh huh. So that suggests the smaller vertebrae. If we come back up here, are yeah. the tailbone. Picture that tail coming back down here that comes back out. You can see a column of backbone vertebrae. And yeah. Here's another femur bone, actually, which is displaced. Uh huh. And then over here, we find those core cords. Now you can see how large those chest bones are, though. Huge, yeah. Here we find the right front flipper, one of the largest bones of the right front flipper. Uh huh. But again, you can see where this area has been eroded, and they actually dug through here looking for more of it, never did find it. Sure. The interesting thing on this one is the neck vertebrae. There's five or six neck vertebrae right here. Uh huh. And that led to the discovery of the skull way over here at the letter P Holy in cow, 1984 by Dr. Wells. That's, that's extraordinary, wow. If you continue around, you'll notice there's another big fissure. Uh huh. And yeah, look at that. Like the a little fault. What happened was that that skull wasn't uncovered on the original dig because uh -huh. it had been displaced and they were looking in the wrong areas. Right. Wow, that's crazy. So it's, it's like the same uh, geological forces that, that lifted up, you know, this it used to be the, you know, an ancient seafloor. Mm -hmm. They also, you know, just running faults right through the middle of the quarry like this and, uh, and making the excavation so much more complicated. And up here, the earth is always moving. So exactly, uh, yeah. Reno just had an earthquake last night. Oh, do they really? Yes, oh, shoot. It wasn't a big one, I hope. It wasn't too bad, no. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, Basin and Range Province, you know, it's... <laughs> So here, we, here we find specimen six. This one's a good example of how long the rib cage was. Uh -huh. At Q, you can see a comb of her brain. You see how they crack and weather. Yeah. They're left untreated or exposed to the illness. Uh -huh. If this building wasn't here, it would just turn to dust. Right. All of this fragmented bone that you see is part of the rib cage. They weren't able to save it. Okay. But they saved it over here at R and they poured the side of concrete to hold it in place. Right. So now you can see how long those rib bones are. The longest one here is almost nine feet long. Holy cow. Well, that suggests these creatures were roughly six feet across their back. Okay. And about eight feet in depth at their two widest points. Holy moly. 
that is, it's, it's whale, that's like the size of a large whale, like a big baleen whale. That's nuts. Actually, I think this animal fits the ecological niche of the sperm whale today in most of its habits. That would make a lot of sense, yeah, another big toothed predator like that. Yeah. Kind of giant squid, it would be diving. Uh-huh. Yeah. Very, very cool. But unlike uh, sperm whale, which today, you know, they've got pretty dinky little eyes. They're not really visual predators. These guys have got, guys have got these enormous, like, dinner plate-sized eyes. Yeah, the whales might have that echolocation, whereas yeah. these rely solely on sight for prey. Uh-huh. Really interesting. Yeah. Specimen set. Okay. So this one's uh, basically facing the corner of the building downslope. Okay. What we find here is a column of vertebrae. This is just one animal. Uh-huh. And a lot of this area, bone that parallels the vertebrae is part of the rib cage. Okay. Now you can trace those uh, vertebrae right up the hill as they come up through U out at the letter S. Right. Here we find a femur. Now we can see the enormity of the femur. Uh-huh. This is probably a larger animal than what we've seen so far. Sure. Finally, we see some of those small phalange bones of the flipper. Yeah, there we go. There's some flipper bones. Now you can see the length of the flipper being close to six feet in length. Very nice. Now, what the flippers on these guys, I think, are really, really interesting because, unlike us, where we've got like a set number of, of finger bones and everything, um, <laughs> uh, with reptiles, oftentimes they can just kind of multiply the, the number of elements that they have in a certain body part. So, like, ichthyosaurs have just got all of these little flat finger bones like that, um, way more than we've got bones in our fingers. In the same way that, like, elasmosaurs, those long neck guys from the Cretaceous, They've got necks with like 72 neck vertebrae in there. And I, it's, it's just kind of amazing how that can work. Like reptiles are really cool like that where uh, they can just kind of multiply some of those elements as, as they evolve, as those lineages change through time. This is one of the few animals too that in through evolution they think went from land to water. Yeah. So they think they start off as a terrestrial reptile and mm -hmm. in the marine environment where they adapted, became highly successful and they yeah. just evolved in, the, in what we see today. Uh huh. Very, very cool. The other yeah. cool thing on this animal is there's another section of rib cage here. Uh -huh. See these rib bones protruding through? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Camp's team took a rock saw to this area and they cut uh -huh. through and you can see the cross-sectional view of those rib bones. Yeah, there you go. Wow. The face of the rock below uh -huh. They're so round. Yeah. Wow. And there very might actually cool. be another animal here, too. I think there's another column of vertebrae right here. Uh -huh. I think it goes like this, but it's not really uh, mentioned in any of the literature, literature I've seen. Interesting. So who knows if there's actually even more than nine in the core. Here. Right, yeah. Wow, very, very cool. I got two more for you guys. Yeah. How long have you been working here, by the way? I mean... This is my 23rd year. 23rd year, holy cow. Yeah. So here at W and X, we find our last two specimens. Okay. And unfortunately, here at W, this column of vertebrae was exposed. Yeah, it looks pretty eroded. Uh, you can see it goes, it might actually extend underneath our plates. Uh-huh. Uh, that we were kind of pointing out earlier. I right. say it's unfortunate because these vertebrae are almost twice the size and diameter of <laughs> any of the ones we've seen so far. Uh -huh. So it's by far a much larger animal, but we can't quantify a length for it just based on the amount of evidence that's here. Uh -huh. Some estimates put that at closer to 70 feet possible. Holy cow. I mean, and, and when you think about, too, just the odds that these would be the largest of the ichthyosaurs that would be preserved, the largest of their species, chances are there were individuals that were a good deal bigger than this, Absolutely. too. Um, it was you, by far the oldest one because reptiles grow until they die. Yeah, um, yeah. But we don't know what their lifespan was. It had to be several decades to reach that. Mm -hmm. Really, really cool. Yeah. Lastly, the only thing placed here is this column of tailbone vertebrae. Uh -huh. You see they're a little more rectangular, much smaller as they go towards the tip of the tail. Mm -hmm. This came off a 30-foot specimen found down near our campground. Okay. And to just give you a scale, on an adult killer whale is around 30 feet in length. Uh -huh. Over here to one that might be almost two and a half times that size. <laughs> Holy moly. That is extraordinary. Wow. You, know, you said down near the campground, so that, all the rock down there is from this same, um, like the same kind of horizon? Pretty much. If you look out the window, you can uh -huh. actually see that limestone deposit. Yeah, That's okay. Uh -huh. So wherever there's limestone deposits, you're going to find a chance to have, or have the chance to find even more uh, ichthyosaur remains, a lot of invertebrates, uh -huh. whatever dates back to the, the Mesozoic or Very the Triassic cool. period. Yeah, yeah. Um, really, really neat. Holy cow. Now, because uh, this is pretty much the, the end of the normal tour, right? That's correct. So, uh, thank you, by the way. This has been awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, and everybody back home is, uh, oh, we've, we've got some congrats on 23 years. Um, yeah, 23 years, Ben knows his stuff. Yes, indeed. Yeah.
um, but they're all very grateful. So, oh, well, appreciate you guys joining. Yeah, in. if um, if anybody wants to maybe donate to Berlinic, the Azores State Park, too, how might they go about doing that? Ah, uh, they could mail monetary donations. The best thing to okay. do is come and visit us and actually see it for yourself. Yeah, absolutely, come uh, see it. Be supporting uh, the local economy. Be supporting yeah. us as a state park, and we have uh -huh. donation boxes throughout. Awesome. Yep. Very, very cool. It, I mean, this is really, really neat that it is in situ like this, and so that people can actually come and and see that there in the ground where it's been for 220 million years. Yep. But it does kind of put you at a disadvantage, too, because you're not near like a big metropolitan center or anything. You're not going to get that many visitors. And this is the first time I've ever made it here. Um, we and have I'm, become very popular, age of the internet, things like that. That's really, so yeah, we're probably as you should be. We get probably averaging closer to 10,000 people annually. Excellent. And it's condensed in the summer months, April, October, when right. the snow's not around. And, uh huh. Um, yeah, just as you see, there's quite a few people walking around this afternoon. So. Exactly. Yeah, people are like walking around outside, <laughs> like clawing at the windows like a cat or something, trying to get in. Um, but speaking of visitors like that, um, what are some of the most common questions that you get here? That maybe, because uh, I'm sure your, your tours are, are, you know, tailored to the questions that you get. But what are some other or questions that maybe wouldn't be covered during the tour? Um, a lot of them, well, the, the tour covers most of everything that yeah. right here. We get the occasional um, creationist ideology. Yeah. Which we, we just <laughs> let people, you know, believe what you want to believe. We're not here to change yep. anybody's mind. Uh -huh. uh, but the most common questions deal with what did they eat? Uh -huh. How did they get to be on this mountain in Nevada if right. they came from the ocean? Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people confuse this with ancient Lake Lahontan, but that was only about 10,000 years ago. Yeah, So these yeah. mountains had already uplifted well before that. Mm -hmm. So just trying to get the public to understand geologic time, really how far back these date is, is the goal. Nice, yeah. No, we talk about that all the time. Um, that's awesome. I mean, yeah. We do get a lot of school groups. Uh, we actually get free tours to Nevada accredited uh, school of, um, organizations, uh -huh. but we get all kinds of folks. We've had University of Berkeley, of course, mm -hmm. um, as far as way as Holyoke College, I think over in Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty widespread, pretty well known. We've had the scientific community come from as far away as Japan mm -hmm. to study this. So. Very cool, yeah. Actually, come to think of it, I'm pretty sure Pat was here just a few weeks ago. Pat Holroyd from Berkeley. She was my mentor when I was there in high school. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah. Um, I'm so glad I was finally able to visit here. This has been such a joy. Uh, really, really neat. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, let's maybe walk down there. Sure. And... and there's lots of exhibits to see if you want to check those out. Well. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Come on, I'm going to open the building for the other guys to come yeah, in. Yeah, of course. If you have any questions, guys, let me know. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Jeff. You're yeah. Welcome. Very, very cool. Oh, and it looks like we're getting a raid here from Lordy. Hello, Lordy and Raiders. I hope you're having a great day. I hope you had a great stream. Finally got this work in here. Very, very nice. So I can give you kind of a, not quite a bird's eye view, but maybe a giraffe's eye view of, uh, of the quarry here. Very, very cool. Yeah. Um, so if you guys have got any questions, uh, you have my attention now, so yeah. yeah. Very, very cool. Man, that model is really funny too. It's just so, those like armor scutes all over it. I don't know quite what to make of that, but it's really funny looking. Yeah. Um, how many people do we have watching now, by the way? I know we had some big difficulties earlier and I had to stop the stream several times. Um, but uh, yeah, somebody let me know what's our current view count. 123, not too shabby, okay. Yeah, Awkward Cyborg says, I would love to visit this fossil site in person. You absolutely should. I mean, holy cow. This is such a cool place, and I, uh, I've been wanting to visit here since I was a kid, watching old episodes of Paleo World and stuff like that on the old Learning Channel. Um, yeah, yeah, always wanted to visit here, and, uh, and now here we are. Very, very cool. Let's take a look at some of the exhibits here. There we go. Here's Charles Kemp's reconstruction of Shonosaurus popularis. There we go. So this animal's actually undergone a lot of changes in how it's reconstructed from the early days. Um, yeah, and it, it's funny, it kind of parallels how, how ichthyosaurs have, have changed over time in popular depictions, you know, so is Shonosaurus. 
We've got that long, skinny skull like that. It's funny, the skull almost kind of reminds me of that of a sperm whale, but a sperm whale's got presumably a very different shaped head because the flesh sits on it very differently. These guys probably did have those long, skinny jaws like that. Um, unlike a sperm whale that's got this gigantic melon on the front of its head that it uses for echolocation. But yeah, and look at that really deep rib cage. That is really, really cool. Yeah. And what's up with the owl? That's probably to keep out bats or something. I don't know. We can ask about that. Um, but yeah, yeah. And check out this ammonite here. So for anybody who was watching Prehistoric Planet recently, like we've been talking about, and shoot, we just had a big discussion about ammonites the other day. Here is an actual ammonite fossil. Uh, this is a pretty large one, but you can see it's not complete. Um, it's been broken off right here, so who knows how, how much further out this would extend. But this is the shell of the animal right here. The body would be in there. This is basically like a, it's a cephalopod, so it's related to squid and octopus. And uh, that's where the fleshy part would be. And so these animals, ichthyosaurs, would have just cruised along and grabbed them with their jaws, maybe, maybe punctured the shell in order to get them to sink, like we saw in Prehistoric Planet with that mosasaur doing that. Or maybe they just would have grabbed them by the soft parts and just kind of tore them out and eaten them. But yeah, this specimen's from Baja, California. Very cool. So ammonites like this, they were hugely successful, like we talked about the other day. These are critters that were around for about 500 million years. And uh, they went extinct at the same time as the dinosaurs, except for birds, 66 million years ago. So they were also claimed by the KPG mass extinction. But these critters were so incredibly abundant and so large that they could have actually sustained, you know, gigantic whale-sized ichthyosaurs like our Shonosaurus here. Very, very cool. Yeah. And yeah, ammonites could get up to like 10 feet across. There you go. Yeah. Um, very cool. Uh, oh, and then... Who can tell me who this is right here? <laughs> I love that <laughs> it's being colored in with crayon there. Whoever did it did a good job. But uh, there is, again, the mother of paleontology herself, Mary Anning. And uh, she is very much tied in with the early history of ichthyosaur. She discovered the first ichthyosaur to be scientifically described. Um, yeah, or she dug it up at least. Again, her brother Joseph, I guess, originally found the skull. But she was able to track down the rest of the body, which was much more difficult. And uh, it was through her tireless work that the world first learned of ichthyosaurs, which is pretty neat. Yeah. Um, yeah, very, very cool. And then here, we've got a bunch of actual fossils. Oh, and it's from this fauna here, from the Luning Formation. Lunning? <laughs> Luning? Anyway, there's a town near here called Luning or Lunning. Not quite sure how to pronounce it. But uh, yeah, various invertebrates. We've got lots of little ammonites like this. We've got brachiopods there, which brachiopods I think might be ex Are they extinct nowadays? No, bivalves are still around. We've got a fossil coral right there. And so these fossils are found all over the place in this region. And that's how people first started to figure out that this was once the bottom of a, of a Mesozoic Sea. Very cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And there we go. Oh, I think this is so people can actually touch a fossil. That's really neat. I like that. <laughs> I think that's important to give visitors a chance to actually touch something, you know? People get really excited about that. Yeah. Very cool. And here's some actual field notes. Very cool. From Charles Camp here. Uh, very nice. This is what I'm going to be doing in uh, just a couple weeks here. Digging up some fossils like that. Uh, <laughs> very cool. Oh, and then we've got the road to fossilization here. Yeah, well, let's hit the road, follow the road to learn what fossils are, how they form, and what happens to them. Yeah, so here's step one here, like we always talk about. <laughs> yeah, 
good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. And so Berlin Ichthyosaurus State Park was established in 1957 to protect the fossil locality and the historic mining town of Berlin. The mining town was active in the late 1800s and estimated to have produced $849,000 in gold and silver. But, so, apparently the, the miners who were working there for decades would find these vertebrae from ichthyosaurs. But they didn't really think much of, like, I don't know, they thought they were weird-shaped rocks or something like that. They were here to make money. They weren't here to make scientific discoveries, you know. And legend has it that they actually use those vertebrae as dinner plates sometimes because they're kind of the right shape for that. Um, it's like a very, very shallow bowl, you know, the way those vertebrae are shaped. So, yeah. Yeah. And is that a campaign hat? No, that's, I don't know what kind of hats those are. The crew is wearing. Yeah. Very cool. Oh, and here is another ichthyosaur. There we go. From, uh, yeah, from Lyme Regis. So this is a cast of one of the ichthyosaurs that Mary Anning would have found. This might actually be one of the ones that she found. Yeah. Very cool. So you can see that super big eye and then all of those conical teeth. Very, very cool. Yeah. So, I mean, the vertebrae on this critter are about that big. And the animal is roughly this long. I mean, it gives you some sense for how big those animals down there would have been in life. Just extraordinary. Yeah, this is, this is such a cool place. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. And it looks like we got a hype train going. I can't really see anything from my angle, but uh, yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um, thank you for your support, everybody. I'll probably be get going here pretty soon because I've got to drive up to northern Nevada tonight. And um, so that'll be my next stop, Paleontologist VA. Um, I may or may not do a stream early tomorrow morning before I leave for Utah. And then after that, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll be doing a stream from the hotel. So, uh, yeah. But after that, I'm not sure when the next time I will be streaming is. I've got the conference starting up on Sunday. Uh, our reception is in Salt Lake City on Sunday. And then if, for the next week, I'm going to be attending this conference, presenting research, hanging out with colleagues and everything. And uh, I'm not sure when the next time I'll be able to broadcast is. Um, yeah, I will be staying in some hotels then. So if they've got good internet and... If it's not too late when I get to the hotel, I might be able to do some nighttime streams. Um, we can cover some fossil news and stuff like that, but I can't make any promises at this point. I'm going to be helping out at the conference a lot. I'm going to be driving other paleontologists around. I'm going to be driving one of those big 15-passenger vans. Um, so, yeah, I might be pretty tired at the end of every day. But uh, around the 12th or 13th or 14th, hopefully I'm going to be out in Wyoming actually digging up some dinosaurs and uh, I will be streaming from there so uh, stay tuned for that yeah um, and thank you Riza Dego I appreciate that yeah and thank you Golgadak um, I'm gonna stream as often as I can but again no no promises um, such a cool place let's take a look one more look down at those fossils and then I love this <laughs> We've got like a plaster, uh, I wonder if this was like a, a maquette or like a miniature that they made before they made the full size one outside, which is right there by the way. You see that out there? Yeah. Um, yeah, very, very cool. Check out that ichthyosaur, amazing. Really, really cool. Um, about what time were the, uh, like the big bass relief, what, what do you call that actually, outside the... Pretty much just the concrete relief. Concrete relief, yeah. What, when was that made? 1956. 56, okay. And the building was constructed in 1966. Wow, wow. 10 years later. And okay. And Dr. Camp had a little uh, party for it, if you guys want to take a look at this. Yeah. It was the celebration <laughs> of the Ichthyosaur Cathedral. Oh, that's phenomenal. All the folks that were either on the excavation or helped uh -huh. with the construction of the building. So, you might Very cool. some names from 
Parkway and others. others Charles places. Camp. Um, let's see. I'm not going to go through every one because it's going to take a while, but really, really cool. Um, what a neat little uh, uh, piece of history there. And I like that they call it the cathedral. I mean, it really does have a certain almost religious aspect to us. It's, uh, it's such a cool place. It's a unique building. It really is, yeah. Um, really awesome. Yeah. Well, I think it's probably about time that I wrap this up, and I might even get one of those mugs, too. How much are the mugs? Uh, these are 25 Okay. That might be a little out of my price range for today, but maybe next time. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, I think I'll go ahead and, uh, and wrap this up, but thank you so much, Jeff. I uh, really, really appreciate it, and uh, everybody here really appreciates you, so... Thanks again. This has been a really fun stream, and I'm thank you for being patient while I work through all those technical difficulties. It's we've got a lot of time under. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks again. Let me go ahead and uh, and wrap this up. Let's see. Uh, let me step outside. Hopefully, the I still get signal right about here. There we go. But that is the full size relief bottle out there. Really, really cool. Holy moly. Yeah. Uh, oh, and don't forget the 3D print. Thank you, Thalo. Let me grab that. Here we go. Lock the car here. And there we are. Here, before I wrap this thing up entirely, I wanted to cool. give you this. So that is a 3D printed model um, of the Crystal Palace Park ichthyosaur. So I don't know if you know the story of the Crystal Palace Park and all that, but in uh, in South London, um, Oh, are we back? Okay. I guess it's working in it again. Okay. Is the raid going right now? Raid is still going. Okay. I'm trying to find a way to activate this, and it is not being very helpful, I'll be honest. Yeah. Um. Oh, and I can see me now. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, that was a ton of fun. I hope you had a good time. And uh, I'm so glad that worked, too. I mean, the Starlink is right here, and I've got that running to the inside of the building. So, again, I'm almost surprised that this thing worked at all. But anyway, thank you so much, everybody, for, uh, for tuning in today. I've got to get my butt to northern Nevada uh, so I can get to the hotel in time, um, so I can get some rest and, uh, and then go off to Utah tomorrow and meet up with some colleagues. So, uh... Yeah, let's go ahead and raid into Paleo Stream, and let's see if that works. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I guess it's not going to work. Well, I'll just say goodbye to everybody right now, and uh, I hope to see you soon. I might stream early tomorrow morning from the hotel if I've got time. But uh, until then, everybody, you take care of yourselves, and uh, go check out PaleoStream. Somebody give PaleoStream a shout-out. And uh, 